It's kind of the hub of this part of the lake, this area right here, that it's kind of the center of the lake. You got, you got the bridge there, which is kind of a landmark. How has it ebbed and flowed over the years, I guess, as far as traffic coming? At that point, he finally looked in the tub and saw all the minnows. And he, they move like they don't have a joint in their whole body. Funding for this program was provided by the Minnesota Environment and Natural Resources Trust Fund, Safe Basements of Minnesota, your basement waterproofing and foundation repair specialist since 1990. Peace of mind is a safe basement. Live wide open. The more people know about West Central Minnesota, the more reasons they have to live here. More at livewideopen.com. Western Minnesota Prairie Waters, where peace, relaxation, and opportunities await. If you've ever sat down and had a burger in this cafe, then you've probably spent some time at Lacoparle Lake. For years, hunters and anglers have traveled from all over the state to enjoy the outdoor recreational opportunities that the Minnesota River Valley has to offer. For nearly 100 years, the Milan Beach Resort has entertained both the locals and the visitors to the area with hot meals, campsites, and more. Well, I was born here, um, so since the late 60s, I've been here. My grandfather started it in 1928, and uh, it moved from him to my mother, and then on to me. Jeff Randall and his wife Stephanie took over the resort in 2013, after Jeff's mother Jane passed away. I spent a lot of time here because Jane and I were in the same class in high school. And I remember coming down here in the summer and I'd help her cook in the back. You know, it was no big thing. Her mother was a peach, just the most sweetest person I've ever met, probably. It has always kind of been my happy place. Um, I grew up, uh, my mom used to work for the Randall family in Appleton. Um, we grew up camping out here. Always been a really happy place for me. While the scenic location was a draw for a lot of visitors, the smell of baked goods often floated through the campground, creating memories for those who spent time as a child there. One of my favorites is Mildred. She would always sneak me in the back door and when she was baking cookies, if we were camping out here, and so I'd come and bake cookies with her. And she was just an amazing lady, a really good baker. Mildred was Jeff's grandmother, who worked long days in the kitchen. Do you have a favorite cookie from Mildred? <laughs> Yes, I remember, I remember being five or six years old and I was standing on a step stool at the stove making donuts with her. She made homemade uh, buttermilk donuts. Mm. And I still make them once in a while. Oh, really? Using her recipe? Using her recipe, which was her mother's recipe. Which Those weren't in the restaurant today? They were. Oh, they were? Oh, yeah, the whole cookbook was there. I mean the donuts. Oh, no. Oh. No, no, I don't. <laughs> I'm coming back for the donuts. <laughs> I'll make you something. All right. <laughs> when Jeff and Stephanie took over, the resort had a lot of miles on it and was in need of repair. Uh, yeah, you know, there was a lot of things to fix up, bring up to code, bring up to date, redo. Uh, a lot of money went into this. Not just us. I mean, there was volunteers and friends and family and people that still put a lot of time in. And... They, you know, want us to be a success. When we took over, that was one of our main goals was to, you know, expand to the full hookup side. Um, that was just what people wanted. You know, they don't want to deal with the honey pot and <laughs> hauling water and, <laughs> and all that. So the whole of the campground was basically the 16 original sites, you know, and then they had just some random campers kind of up to the north end kind of pulled in here, there, and everywhere. There was no, basically beyond the outhouse up there, there was nothing. It was just trees and a few campers. So it used to be just plug in and go. We put meters on all of the spots. We added 24 full hookup spots. 
we've done a lot of like landscaping and tree cleanup and kind of all those things that kind of got neglected towards the end and just an overall kind of rehab of, of things. Those campsites are a valuable commodity and don't open often, with some sites hosting the same family for a long time. At longer than we've been alive. <laughs> so 50, 50 years. Apparently they like it here. <laughs> you know, it's been through a lot of changes. Taking over and running a place that has such an emotional bond for you and your family isn't always easy. Sometimes it feels like it's an immense pressure. You know, good, but it's like, are we doing it justice? Are we upholding what they would have wanted? Or is, is this where they saw it? You know, what, you know, are we, are we living up to that? Do you think you are? I like to think so. Sure. Uh, I'd like to think so. I don't know. I don't know how they fit all of the stuff in that they used to do. You know, it's, you hear the stories of all the things, you know, Jose trapped minnows and he ran a trap line up to the Twin Bridges and, you know, how? <laughs> how, did, how did you get all that in in a day? I don't think they slept. <laughs> well, the campground and cafe have been popular with the locals, the resort used to have more options for fun. Somewhere he had a dance hall here and a skating rink and then uh, the resort just kind of happened piece by piece, I do believe, uh, camping the cafe, boat rentals, cabins, and whatever else they could find to do uh, along the lake. It's kind of the hub of this uh, part of the lake, this area right here, that it's kind of the center of the lake. You got, you got the bridge there, which is kind of a landmark. How has it ebbed and flowed over the years, I guess, as far as traffic coming? Like, I, I'd assume that probably in the 80s there when goose hunting was 70s and 80s, maybe that was kind of a, a it was probably pretty wild back then. Uh, yeah, you got that right. There were people all over the place. Uh, but if we go, you know, a step back further, back to the 40s and 50s, 30s, 40s and 50s, there were a lot more farm families in the area. Instead of seeing one farm in a mile section back then, there were maybe two or three individual little farms, farming and making a living. So you had all these kids, all these families, not a lot of money, and the closest place to go on the day off, or if it's hot, is down by the water. But what makes the region a destination for hunters and anglers almost closed the business. He started the restaurant thinking that lake was going to be lined with cabins. And in the 60s, the state come and the DNR started the wildlife refuge here and eminent domained all the property on, along the lake. So we and maybe two other families have land close to the lake. For reasons unknown to Jeff, the resort was allowed to stay. So they focused on the wildlife. So, you know, we're the only resort on the lake. We're really the only place on the lake shore that the public can, can go. Besides the state park, besides a picnic area, boat landing. During the height of the goose hunting craze around Lac Parle, the lake would hold around 150,000 Canada geese, and the area was crawling with camouflage. And those people would boost the local economy. And along with that came the people in the fall that wanted to hunt. And it was a lot of metro people, a lot of people outside the area that would come in to, to do this. The, the state had state blinds uh, along the lake that you could rent. Um, 118 of them and they were all full and uh, every farmer had their field rented out for the goose season. Yeah, everybody thrived. Everybody was making money. It was, it was a, a fun time to, to be here. And those people were coming in and eating at your restaurant, staying at your resort? Yeah, staying at the resort. We had cabins back then, of course the cafe, the campground. We had a gas pump back then. So it benefited everybody. And even though you could only shoot one goose here back then, uh, it, was, it was a draw like I've never seen as far as people. I remember going in and clearing tables for them, you know, during goose hunting season, and it was just crazy. It was a crazy time. And goose hunting around here can still be good. It's not like it once was. What happened with the business as the goose hunting started to decline? Oh, it declined. It's hard. 
I mean, there's not a lot of extra money. There's days or months or weeks that you uh, cross your fingers and hope that you make it because that was a huge part of, of the income back then. Another landmark that can be tied to the resort was the famous Milan Bridge. You know, a lot of people had that had a really intense connection to that bridge. You know, so they come in and tell stories of jumping off the bridge or, um, you know, just fishing off the, the rocks and the amazing fish they would catch. Despite the popularity of that bridge, its age was showing and it became the focus of a necessary infrastructure improvement. In the last two years, uh, the bridge project where they put in a new concrete bridge, uh, that road was closed for two years, two and a half years, and so that was almost nothing. And we had the pandemic, which I had to close, which takes away even more. The last five years, it's been tight, but we still make it. You know, we still get up and do what we have to do, and we'll do it until I don't want to anymore. <laughs> It's that kind of perseverance that has kept the resort going and a favorite breakfast and lunch spot for locals. Fishing has become more popular in recent years and the lake has even hosted a few tournaments. It was the uh, Paul Larson Memorial Tournament. A friend of mine passed away a few years ago and uh, they started a tournament in his name. The proceeds go to the local high school scholarship programs, I, I do believe. Yeah, my son Austin, who is uh, 15 now, he is my tournament partner in the summer, and he got the biggest fish of the day, he got the only fish of the day, and he won the tournament. I'm just there to drive the boat and net the fish. It was 29 and 3 quarter inch walleye. Didn't catch a single fish all day, it was <laughs> storm at the beginning of the day. And then, thinking about quitting, but we decided to make one more last troll through the back where we started, then we would leave. And It was really foggy when we started and there was no wind. Uh, Mid-morning, a very intense storm came through, a lot of wind, a lot of rain. It was getting pretty bad, though. We had to reel up our lines for probably 15 minutes or so. And uh, The tournament was at the end of August. It was uh, a slow bite that day. Um, there were only five fish turned in out of 75 boats for the whole tournament. You know, we both were getting bored. We were not catching anything. It was kind of hot. We talked about quitting. Almost thought about giving up, and all of a sudden you look back and rods doubled over, and next thing you know, you're reeling a 29 and a half inch walleye. Won every category of the tournament, seven plaques, and I don't know how much money we got, 9,000. I mean, it was <laughs> just an incredible day, and I couldn't have been more proud to have my son catch it right in front of me on that day. With the resort being a, a, a family business, is he, is he gonna be running the resort someday? Oh gosh, I hope not. <laughs> um, I, I hope he decides to do whatever he wants to do that's going to make him happy. And uh, if it's not this, then I support it. There's a lot of challenges in owning a resort, particularly one that's been in the family for a long time. But at the end of the day, if you get to spend time with family, doing things you love, you'll find ways to make it work. Oh no. Oh no! <laughs> uh, the Milan Beach Resort offers hot meals and cold sun drops and can give you a glimpse into the storied past of hunting and fishing at Lac Parle Lake. Carol Henderson, the Minnesota DNR's first non-game wildlife supervisor, is chiefly responsible for bringing back native species that have vanished from our state, like trumpeter swans, peregrine falcons, and bluebirds. Human intervention wreaked havoc on many of our creatures, including otters in the Minnesota River Valley. Otter was distributed pretty much statewide originally when, in uh, settlement times. And obviously the habitat was better in northern Minnesota with more wetlands, more beaver ponds, and uh, lakes, rivers. But they also were present out on the prairie along the smaller rivers, well, the Minnesota River and all the tributaries. During the 1800s, 
there was incredible pressure for trapping and virtually no regulations or restrictions for seasons or bag limits. And even a modest amount of trapping pressure apparently caused the local population of otters to become extirpated. By the mid to late 1800s in southwestern Minnesota. Carroll first noticed that otters were missing from the Minnesota River in the mid-1970s when he was assistant manager of the Lacoparle Wildlife Refuge. And I met local conservationists like Ben Tomai at the Wilmer Sportsman's Club and they were an inspiration because they had initiated lots of conservation projects. One of their themes was let's put something back and I thought wow that's a really nice conservation message for anybody and as I got more involved with my work at Lac Ruparo, you know, I, I realized what animals were present and which ones apparently were missing, that the otter was missing. And then when I was selected to join the DNR as the non-game wildlife program supervisor uh, in 1977, that changed my whole perspective in terms of the potential for making a difference in bringing back wildlife species that we may have lost or, or that species that have been greatly decimated in the past. Carol's new duties at the DNR St. Paul headquarters included tracking fur bearer species like otters, bobcats, and martens, and then reporting to the federal government on the number of pelts sold by Minnesota trappers. And that's when I learned about a wonderful PhD dissertation from the University of Minnesota by Evadine Burris Swanson about use and conservation of Minnesota game from 1850 to 1900. And it gave a history of what happened to the bison, to the elk, to the caribou, to the beaver, uh, to the otter, uh, even it had information about the disappearance of passenger pigeons from Minnesota. From that dissertation, I obtained records of fur buyers from Southwest Minnesota who had actually been buying otters from local trappers during the middle to later 1860s and 70s. So I knew they were originally from that region. And that's where I thought, maybe what we should do is try a restoration project for otters as one of our first efforts. Because I was on a statewide budget of no more than 25 or $30,000 per year, including my salary, I didn't have much money to work with. So if I wanted to do something I had to do a low budget approach. So I came up with a strategy of how to get some otters using my knowledge of who the otter trappers were in northern Minnesota because they had to report to me every year. So I sent a note out to the successful otter trappers and just introduced myself and said I have a background in trapping. I grew up trapping as a farm boy in Iowa and, and I was familiar with what needed to be done and what, in terms of what kinds of traps could be used. And, I, and uh, we ended up suggesting a small coil spring mink trap, which wouldn't necessarily hurt their, their feet when they got caught. We got 11 people approved to get permits to catch otters for us. And so they were gonna get $150 a piece. I still needed the money to pay for that. So the Wilmer Sportsman's Club offered $600 to cover four otters. And then I had friends in St. Paul Audubon Society who were interested in this. So they offered $600. And then I went to the Minnesota Archery Association and they had donated $600. So now I had $1,800 to bring back uh, 11 or 12 otters that following year. In November of 1980, a conservation officer who knew of the otter restoration project called Carol about an otter in the officer's custody. There was a family that lived up on the Northwest Angle who had had a young otter stay around their fishing camp all summer. They called him crazy because he would jump in the boat, run around and try to find minnows or fish that were lying around in the boat, then jump out and, and uh, it just totally lost his fear of people. When fall came, the owners of the resort were worried that the otter was gonna get in trouble and, and, and get uh, taken as a pelt. And uh, so they tried to smuggle the otter through customs. Well, they got caught <laughs> and they confiscated this otter. So they called me 
wanted to know if I could use the otter. I said, sure, I'll, I'll take the otter. We'll le release him out at Lappy Parle. I got the otter, and then I had to figure out how do you babysit an otter overnight before I can get out to Lackview Parle. Uh, so I went down to the local Vados bait shop here <laughs> in the Twin Cities and, and uh, got an ice cream bucket full of lots of minnows. So I thought, well, what, could, what, what should I do? Well, how about if I just fill the bathtub, put the minnows in and just see if I, he's hungry? <laughs> well, I took him out of the cage took him into the bathroom, shut the door. He went running around and around, checking out everything, just incredibly curious. I was looking for doors. He, was, he pushed open the door to the towel closet, and I had to shut that. And then he tried to, he pushed open the door for the clothes chute. I could dive to the basement, but I had to slam that shut. Well, then he tried to push up the lid on the toilet, and that was the point where I <laughs> had to shut that down. So anyway, at that point, he finally looked in the tub and saw all the minnows, and he just, they move like they don't have a joint in their whole body. They're just fluid in their movement. It's so graceful, incredible, and so aware of their surroundings. Well, he was just inhaling one minnow after the other until there was only one left. The next day, Carol took Oscar to Lacoparle. Let him off by the water. He runs out in the water. He's there about a, not hardly 30 seconds, and he comes back up to my feet with a bullhead in his mouth and cr proceeds to crunch down the bullhead. I, I think they're so successful in their foraging for fish that they don't have to spend a whole lot of time hunting for fish. So they have a lot of what you might call playtime. Oscar was the first otter released in the Minnesota River Valley. Over the next two years, 22 more otters were released at Lac Parle in the Big Stone National Wildlife Refuge. And we didn't need to release very many because otters have a unique reproductive strategy called delayed implantation. They have their pups in the spring, and then within a month or so, they immediately remate and get pregnant, but the eggs do not develop until the following spring. So you could say that a female otter is either always pregnant or about to get pregnant. <laughs> By having that kind of a bias toward catching the pregnant females, we knew that we weren't just catch, releasing 22 otters, we were releasing a whole lot of otters through the following year with the pups that the females would be having. In other states, they were putting radio transmitters inside the otters and tracking their movements afterwards. Well, I didn't have money for that. I, I just trusted the otters to be smart enough to figure out how to make it on the Minnesota River at Lac Creek Parle. The thing that was amazing about otters is that they're very dog-like in their intelligence. They learn quickly. They're, they're wonderful, brilliant animals. Of course, we didn't have radio telemetry to use for finding where the otters went, but we had subsequent sightings of People seeing otters playing out on the ice at Lackey Parle Lake or on the Minnesota River. Someone who was uh, spearing northerns on, on Lackey Parle Lake and he was just kind of bent over his hole in the ice waiting for a northern to come by and an otter just kind of exploded out of the open water and looked at him a little bit and then went back down again and <laughs> shocked both him and the otter, I think. People who still work out there have done otter surveys and found that the otters have basically moved up and down the river all the way down to Mankato and up and down the various tributaries of the Minnesota so that they're back where they once were over a hundred years ago. With two years of effort and with the money I raised the first year and then we scratched up enough money for about $1,300 the next year out of the non-game program from checkoff donations. For under $4,000 we did the entire reintroduction project uh, to bring back otters in southwest Minnesota. The most important thing about restoring some of these lost species is that they may have been missing from our scene, from our state, for over a hundred years. We don't know what we're missing. We don't know what role those animals are playing in the ecological chain of things in terms of the balance of nature or how they fill a role as a predator or prey species and, and how they can just energize our lives and inspire us to do more good things for nature.
True or false? Zebra mussels are invasive, but they do contribute to water clarity, which is good for our lakes. False. Zebra mussels filter tiny food particles out of the water, which reduces food for larval fish and other animals. The increased water clarity can promote aquatic plant growth as light penetrates to lower levels and changes the predator-prey dynamics. We can stop aquatic hitchhikers from infesting more lakes and streams by cleaning up everything we pull out of the water. It's a simple drill. Clean in, clean out. Before leaving a water access, clean your boat and water equipment. Remove and dispose of all plants and aquatic species in the trash. Drain water from your boat, ballast tanks, motor, live well, and bait container. Remove drain plugs and keep drain plugs out while transporting equipment. Dispose of unwanted bait in the trash. To keep live bait, drain the water and refill the bait container with bottled or tap water. And if you have been in infested waters, also spray your boat with high pressure water. Rinse with very hot water, dry for at least five days. Stop the spread of AIS. Funding for this segment was provided by the Aquatic Invasive Species Task Forces of Wright, Meeker, Yellow Medicine, Lacquaparle, and Big Stone Counties. Funding for this program was provided by the Minnesota Environment and Natural Resources Trust Fund, Safe Basements of Minnesota, your basement waterproofing and foundation repair specialist since 1990. Peace of mind is a safe basement. Live wide open. The more people know about West Central Minnesota, the more reasons they have to live here. More at livewideopen.com. Western Minnesota Prairie Waters, where peace, relaxation, and opportunities await.